you know the juicy stuff is when we live life all in when we're protecting ourselves from and not engaging and not mm. not living a full life we're, mm. we're missing out on so much of it but i think a lot of us tend to do that oh we, I, no doubt and then of course we have to bring another concept into this whole podcast and that's spirituality yes now if we lose in touch if we disconnect so much that we lose in touch with our core being and our sense of spirit then we are pretty there's, a, there's almost like a spiritual wilderness yeah that sounds um, scary when you said that then spiritual wilderness i felt a reaction to that it's like oh <laughs> <laughs> We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 58, Bob. Seven's your lucky number. We haven't got one in this one. So in this episode, we're going to be looking at the search for meaning in therapy. You know... I know you say it's the 58th, but of all the titles of podcasts, this probably is one of the most uh, important, uh, probably, I feel important, poignant, um, precious, or whichever language I want to use, because this is why I think people come to therapy, actually. Yeah. And, all, and they may come for lots of reasons which are triggering them in the presence they may come and look at trauma they can look at many things in their histories usually in therapy though as you work through the layers you get to existential issues which are all about the meaning of purpose you know of their lives in the psychotherapeutic uh, psychotherapeutic terrain now one of the most poignant books you could get to read is by Victor Frankl, Victor J. Frankl. I don't know when he wrote this book, it's a long time ago, it might have been in the 70s or early 80s, you know, and it's called The Search of Meaning. Um, you know, I think it's called The Search of Meaning. Uh, yes, anyway, it's by Victor, Victor J. Frankl. And he himself was a, a psychoanalyst, I think, or stroke psychotherapist. I think he was a stroke psychotherapist because he created logotherapy. Um, and so must, this book must have come out in the 70s, I think. He spent uh, quite a long time, with his, uh, I don't know how long, actually, in concentration camps. Um, and it was in concentration camps that he really, you know, reflected on these existential issues and the purpose of life and the meaning for life and uh, it's a very good book to read and I am absolutely have no hesitation to think most people come to therapy so they can understand themselves and it's the therapist's job to help them understand what is ununderstandable to them yes yeah that's a really good way of putting it oh, I believe yeah because a lot of the things we we do, but we don't understand. <laughs> That's right. So we help them understand the un understandable. Yeah, yeah. I know it's not a Scrabble world, but it's <laughs> because it's longer than seven. seven <laughs> un understandable. So thing, you know, it's thing, and many of the existential issues that come up: futility of life, uh, mortality, um, feeling hopeless, helpless. Um, all these real existential issues uh, that are brought to therapy, often as you go down the layers, those issues come to the forefront. Uh, particularly, you know, with the clients that I've seen, when they feel like they've made, you know, massive strides and then literally they go right back to the beginning again. Yeah, because they have to go through the layers to get to what's really underneath it all. And really what's underneath it all is uh, the meaning of life, the meaning of what's the purpose in life. Um, many of these existential issues. In another life, I would have loved to train 
as an existential psychotherapist because you know Yalom, who's one of my mentors and heroes um he 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 he's probably the most well well one of the most well-known existentialist psychotherapists of all time and he wrote all the, these books i think the first book was um executioners i can't quite remember the title but um and he talked you know in a very accessible ways about his cases and all the existential um you know things that come up mortality hopelessness love envy guilt rage we could go on and on but underneath it all i think is about purpose and meaning of life so why would you work with a client that doesn't feel like there is any purpose well once just step back i don't think many th clients come back come into therapy in my experience saying what i've just said some do about purpose in life but a lot of people have a lot of other things which are happening to themselves in life uh, which then lead to some of these things i'm talking about as we have further exploration but if somebody did come in and say well i want to you know i want to explore uh, you know my my life because i feel i've got to a place where there's no purpose in life or you know life is futile and i get up in the morning and there's no meaning to life I mean, besides exploring the obvious, which is like, is this familiar to you through all your life? I mean, has yeah. this occurred? And Because I always think developmentally. And uh, if they say, and usually do, by the way, say, yes, I've been feeling this for, since I was a teenager or something, then you would do lots of inquiry. Uh, and in TA, you probably call it script analysis. But in other languages, you might call it phenomenological inquiry open questions well tell me a little bit more about that how does that fit into that so you're talking about feeling a lack of purpose in your life oh when how come when did that start well i've always felt it since i was about 12 14 and and then you just take them back and start gradually helping them you know unfold if you like and exploring oh and you know does that come with perhaps a lack of someone being curious curious with you or not accounting for you or you know just going down the layers yeah so you're helping them reflect inquire look at where all this has come because babies aren't bored you know with a lack you know they don't start how can i explain this they get their purpose in life usually from the dynamic with their significant caretakers to start off with yeah usually it's to do jackie it's usually to do with ruptures in the early attachment system with the early caretakers actually yeah. when you work it all the way down yeah because i was you know one of the things that a lot of people fall into when because when you were talking then about, you know, not having any, you know, feeling helpless and hopeless and not having any meaning and things like that. Sometimes clients get drawn into that. I need to do more stuff. Yeah. And, and that's usually to escape, to escape from the desolate feelings. Yeah. About themselves, others or the world. Yeah. And it's scary when it feels nothing. <laughs> mm. Mm, yeah that's right you're pa absolutely right now nothingness isn't a feeling no so if they say something like what you just said i feel you know i wake up in the morning and there's a sense of nothingness i would probably say what you know that sounds pretty bleak so what's the feelings that go with that nothingness you know is it things like real sadness or you know and i take them further down underneath the 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 the, the, the uh, sentence they've said so you know and a lot of people come in and they don't want to go that far down and that that's absolutely fine ta's very got contracts at his head so you, you you'd follow the contract but many people will and do want to go further and in, in therapy with me i would always encourage that if i had a contract of course uh, to look at what's the feelings with the nothingness What's, what do you actually, what are you thinking and feeling when you wake up in the morning and you just don't want to get out of bed, you've got no motivation, you feel life's futile? 
What's that all about? Have you any idea? No. And I'd explore it like that. So we can get to find out, you know, what's so, what is it that is beneath it all? And help them understand what often is so understandable. Usually, usually we go back to trauma. Right. What I've just said is usually there's a rupture in the attachment system or we have a traumatic process going on earlier in their lives where they've moved into what you just said. They moved into defending or by either by doing things, by going to cognitive processes to become X, X, and X. So they, they cut themselves off. Yeah. From the trauma feelings or whatever's down there. But as they go on in life, often in their 40s and 50s, then they start to perhaps um, there's more or triggers in life or whatever it is, they may start then feeling a, a void between the two parts of themselves or three parts of themselves, or there's something in the trigger that takes them back. And that's when they come to therapy. Yeah. Because it's, it's a big subject, isn't it? You know, the, the title of this, the search for meaning in therapy. And, you know, when we're talking about the meaning of life, it's, it's big. It's very big and it's also existential core issues at the center of our being. Yeah. So that's, you can't get anything really bigger. And so that's what I'm saying. There has to be a contract to go to those places. Yeah. Because, and you think of depression. So, you know, just say if you put depression to Google, it's probably the number top uh, mental health term that people use yeah and, and many many people come with the depression so you can deal with depression at the sort of you know uh in the present at a certain level you can help people look at different coping mechanisms you could go to another level though you could say is this familiar for you how far does the depression go back and go back to when it started and it can go even younger yeah to look at when they disconnected from themselves for example and that could take you right into a whole vacuum of processes. Yeah. So, yeah, it is a really important word. Yeah, it is. It's, it, it, like I said, it, it, it does depend on the client and how far back they want to go. But sometimes we, we teeter on the edge of it mm. Mm. without the client wanting to, to go any further. Well, that's why I say contracts are so important. Yeah. That. And it's, this isn't about going to places that, you know, people don't want to go. No. It's a, a contractual therapy where there's a bilateral agreement between the therapist and the client to help the person understand different parts of themselves or help them understand where the etiology of this trauma came from or, or wherever. Yeah, yeah. Contracted between two people. Yeah. Which is really important. I believe so. I think you're really hitting on an important area where therapists can, I believe, sometimes take people into areas that they perhaps didn't want to go because there's not been a contract. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because it's... It... Well, I was going to say then it's not up to the client to stop us going there. You were going to say what? Say it I again. was going to say it's not up to the client to stop us going there. Well, usually they're not in a, they can often be in a place where they're much younger. Yeah. They, they haven't got the resources around them. To, yeah. And so they usually or might adapt to the therapist. I think it's up to the therapist to make sure there's a bilateral contract. Yeah. Yeah. From adult to adult, not from parent to child. Hundred percent, because the the client, you know, it, it's not their job to to keep safe in the therapy room. That that's our job through contracting and everything else. Yeah, hmm. I, I think this type of therapy, when it has to be contractual, and may and the other thing I want to say, if we talk about mortality issues or really strong existential issues that go through 
to the core of our very being, we're often talking about long-term psychotherapy. This isn't short-term psychotherapy because yeah. we're heading towards such, such big, in your phrase, big issues. Yeah. It isn't something yeah. we do in six, you can't do this in six sessions. Six years, maybe. If you're lucky, I would imagine. It, yes, mortality is a really interesting one because I suppose, you know, maybe grief and loss and things like that come up quite early on and then you go down a level and then down a level and then we kind of look at mortality and... Yeah. 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 You see, the thing is, from the moment we're born, we're dying. Yes, yeah. And I think there's always a death anxiety. Yellen would always agree with me that, uh, that there's always a low-grade death anxiety that we're deflecting from by doing things. So we move away from a sense of being, mainly because we don't want to feel or we don't want to get in touch with the feelings that go with a generalised death anxiety, although feelings of were day by day moving towards um, leaving this planet. Now, that is really frightening for so many people. They won't go anywhere near that. Yes. The problem is, the problem is though, is in that process, they may disconnect so much from their self that they end up disconnected. So they then travel through life pretty well in one dimension. Yeah. So, so, you know, and a lot of people, as they get their 50s, 60s, 70s, actually start, you know, as they're, as they're moving nearer the front of the queue, if you want to put it that way, in terms of stepping off this planet, they start to get in touch with mortality issues. They go, get to start, they allow themselves, if you like, to go to places which they didn't allow themselves to go because their feelings mm -hmm. were so, it was so difficult. So I think... I think mortality issues can come up at any age, but they often are triggered by our own age. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly look different at things now than what I did when I was a lot younger. Yeah. 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 So, There's so certain... issues are very, very, I like the face big, but they're very deep, intense, reflective. But in the end of the day, you, you write what you said earlier on, to adapt, survive, and live our lives, we deflect from having to feel all those things that go with what we're talking about here, our yeah. central being, our central core. But if we disconnect into to a bigger way or intense way, we can lose sense of our central core. And that is unhealthy. That is pretty unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'd like to think that you know the juicy stuff is when we live life all in when we're protecting ourselves from and not engaging and not mm. not living a full life we're, mm. we're missing out on so much of it but i think a lot of us tend to do that oh we, I, no doubt and then of course we have to bring another concept into this whole podcast and that's spirituality yes now if we lose in touch if we disconnect so much that we lose in touch with our core being and our sense of spirit then we are pretty there's, a, there's almost like a spiritual wilderness yeah that sounds um, scary when you said that then spiritual wilderness i felt a reaction to that it's like oh <laughs> that doesn't yeah. sound like a happy place i i did a polit politics degree I was a politics lecturer from 29 to 38, even though I started psychotherapy training and working at 35. And this is where I, I don't want this podcast to be a political, <laughs> too much political. Uh, but if I look at the, in my opinion, so podcast listeners can just, may have completely different views here. But if I look at the political leadership and where we are right at this moment, I think there's a moral spiritual vacuum in the United Kingdom. And that is why I think often we're heading towards what I might like to say, a spiritual wilderness or, yeah, let's stop there. But I think the modern, the political, where we are politically in the United Kingdom at the moment, um, I think many great, many existential issues are raised. 
And if anybody's listening to this and would like to comment, you can comment to Bob's <laughs> what statement that he's just said on YouTube, and I'm sure he would love to have a discussion about it. Yeah, they, I, I was always taught that, you know, psychotherapy is where art and science meet, meets, but it's hard to keep the politics out of psychotherapy. Yeah. So, yeah. I, do, I really do believe that. Um, I do believe that. I don't. I, I, I like to think that I haven't lost the political side of me in the... I mean, psychotherapy, certainly when I trained to become a psychotherapist and the career of psychotherapy became at the forefront. But but actually now more and more, you know, I'm turned back to politics a little bit more. And I know, again, this pod, podcast isn't about this, but many of the existential issues may come from political decisions, actually. Or be triggered. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and to be fair, I, th I think we're in unprecedented times now with a lot of things. So, yeah. We are in unprecedented <laughs> times. We are, yes. Yeah. We're here with many, many big issues in the world. Yeah. So this is big. And, and you know, I, I'm sure that if I was working clinically now, many of these existential issues are probably and would be getting triggered by many of the events that are happening yeah. in the UK and abroad. But when we're talking about existential events and, you know, deep and meaningful stuff, there aren't any answers, Bob, are there? No, but you know, Jackie, the more disconnected we, we become from the different parts of the self, the more, the more we're likely to live more of a vacuous life yeah it's yeah. an expl yeah well yeah i get it it's just it's an exploration you yeah. know a lot of the times i think clients come particularly when they are looking for purpose or meaning and feeling helpless and hopeless is that they want answers they do but let me give you a, a, an answer then to something what is the most you know what okay all these things are happening Okay, well, often people can come in and say, I feel really powerless, I feel really depressed, I watch all these things that are happening, I have a real sense of helplessness, and they listen to television, they watch all the news, they this, 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 and this. What they don't do is get, up, get off the seats, go on political marches, uh, get involved, and that in itself, they would start to feel more empowered because they would be feeling they were doing something and moving away from a helpless position. Yeah. Now, often they don't do that because of their histories and their, the disconnected parts of the self. Now, if you can work with these disconnected parts of their self, where they can get their power and energy and passion back again, they'll, yeah. probably, get, they'll probably move away from being a bystander and a passive, you know, that level of passivity that goes with it to perhaps daring to take their place in the modern world. Yeah. But yeah. first of all, they have to be connected with themselves and they have to start moving away from this powerless position as they often feel into. And this is the world of therapy. And this is why I've been proud to be a therapist for 37 years. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I was thinking about, you know, because a lot of it, when they're feeling helpless and hopeless and everything, it, it's they're in a very young place it's the child you know and to start off with for me I would probably let them know that it's a safe place and give them safety and security and reliability and trust and all those sorts of things because you know when we're looking at that what did you call it spiritual wilderness wilderness I think my younger self freaked out when you said that phrase. It, it's like, geez. But it, it's about containing that within the therapy room so that there can be an exploration to go as deep as they want to do or mm. not. Or not. That's the bit where you yeah. just said. So yeah. some boundaries in this. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Some containment. Yes. Yeah. No, I really I, agree with that. Yeah, I agree with what, all the things you've just said there. I really agree with. Good. I I like I like 
a contained space, do you know what I mean? But like you said, hopefully there's been, you know, open contracts or contracts that have been done around this so that we know what we're doing. But I, I agree, clients taking action and feeling empowered and getting a fire in the belly sometimes is mm. good. I'm not saying we all need to go on a, a march or anything, but... Well, maybe that would be a symbol of what we're talking about here. But, you know... We deal with people who are often so traumatized that it leads to lack of motivation, yeah. disconnection, uh, and feeling so worthless yeah. that there's no movement. So that as a psych psychotherapist, as you start to people, you know, help people empower themselves uh, and make transformational actions in life, you know, I, I felt very I've always felt very proud to be part of their journeys yeah into that level of uh, empowerment and transformation yeah. and if i've had a part to play in that whole road um i can only thank them and be glad i'll be part of it yeah and it, it is it is wonderful to to think that that can happen in a therapy room that's where we'll start yeah, it's it's a really it is a powerful place to be. It's like another universe sometimes. There's yes. the rules that exist in, in the therapy room don't exist anywhere else that I can think of. So you said all the right things I believe in safety, security, containment, understanding that we're dealing with the younger self, all those yeah. they have to have a secure base, you know. And if we yeah. think of uh, not far away now, how many people have lost their secure base? How many people have been displaced? How many people uh, lie in those traumatized wastelands? Um, you know, and and what's happening to our world at the moment is I know at a much bigger level, but actually, you know, a lot of these very very um, at a at a micro level, um, we see them in the, the therapeutic room. Yeah. Yeah, there's an awful lot played out in the therapy room. It's an amazing yeah. place to be. <laughs> I, do, I do feel privileged to, to, to be able to walk into that room every so often with people. Yeah, I mean, we're privileged, aren't we, to go on those journeys with these people. Yeah. You know, as I said, people often say to me, you had a, had a good career, have you enjoyed your career? And I say, well, I haven't actually finished my career yet. However, when I've got past that statement, the answer is yes. Yeah. It's been very satisfying. But, you know, unless I did my own therapy and I'd done a lot of work on myself, uh, I, I wasn't able to get to a place where I could be the therapist that I needed to be to be on these journeys with people in a fruitful way. Yeah. That's the other side of it all. Yeah. And certainly not to go to the places I'm talking about, these existential issues we're talking about here. Um, that takes a lot of work on yourself, I think. Yeah, that it, it's. I I wouldn't say that I've been down to these existential places with with any clients, if at all. But it's mind blowing. You you would have worked on certain layers though, Jackie. There's no definitely doubt. layers. Yeah, yeah. They get played out at, at, at different layers, and we. And I think, Bert, it was Eric Byrne, the originator of TA, that really wanted contracts to be at the central center of this new psychotherapy model that he created and I, I really like contracts bilateral contracts with a specific specified outcome between two people yeah and contractual I believe the contract con contractualness is really important I think when working uh, so that we we don't we have a container we have a structure we we you know we don't go to taking people to places they don't want to go yeah so because in these areas of existentialism we can go many many deeper places and then of course people often who spent all their lives trying to defend against feeling the feelings of the trauma the disconnection or, or whatever we're talking about here are suddenly faced in this um, void which perhaps they haven't got the resources to cope with and then of course we're into a different ball game altogether so contracts I think are very important. Yeah. Safety, procurement, containment, all the things you're talking about. 
yeah, definitely. Which we all should have in place. And if anybody's listening and they haven't, then yeah. Then uh, make sure you do have it. Yes, it should be done. It's <laughs> paramount. Right, Bob, yeah. I think we'll leave it there. I've, I've really enjoyed this one. It's been a bit deep. And apart from that, yeah, spiritual wilderness phrase that my child didn't really like, I think it's been okay. <laughs> Except for that, except for that, it's been okay. Well, I might I'm, need a bit of therapy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, thanks a lot for that, Jackie, and take care. Okay, dog. See you on the next one. Bye. 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 You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.